guys, it's Will, it's Hong Kong Cinema Appreciation Society. Welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, thank you for finding me. I'm gonna get right into this video because I don't want it to be too long. If you could sub though, if you are a new, uh, a new viewer, that would be a huge help. Thank you so much. And leave us a comment. Tell me what kind of movies you like, what kind of Blu-rays you like, what kind of stuff you collect, what you're into, so we know what people who watch the channel are watching for, because that will help direct the content as we go forward. I am here with a Blu-ray review. It is Black Cat is the 88 films release. This is a kind of a cult classic 1991 action sci-fi film that has some elements of kind of John Woo style shoot 'em up type stuff uh, and is also an unofficial kind of remake slash adaptation of the Femme Nikita, the French film. I just want to say before I get deep into this video, it's really hot in my study right now because uh, as you can see, it's all glass. I don't know if you can see the windows. Where am I pointing at? <laughs> Over there. So I'm surrounded by windows on most sides. And it just gets really hot, so I have the door open. But on the other side of the door, there's an aviary. So there's like, I don't know, 30 birds over there. So if it's, if there's a lot of avian chatter. I apologize, but I'm doing it to prevent myself from sweating too much in this video. So this film was released in 1991. And it stars uh, Jade Long, who is right there on the cover. This was her first film. She was a model uh, who was cast by Stephen Shin, who is the director and the producer, as the lead in the film. Simon Yam is also in the movie. And so is Thomas Lamb, who I think does a, his performance is very good. Very, like, natural, loose, credible. So if you're unfamiliar with the Femme de Kida, the basic plot of this movie is a woman, who is played by Jade Long, gets arrested. And then she tries to escape the custody of... Uh, the police, and in doing so, she is shot, she is declared dead, then the CIA take her and put her into a special program to train her as like a super assassin, essentially. And Simon Yam is the guy who plays her handler, and then maybe this is a minor spoiler alert, but eventually she is put out into the world to assassinate people, and she gets a boyfriend, and that's Thomas Lamb's character. And they're really like the only three characters who are consistent throughout the film, and who create the main dramatic kind of thrust and narrative arc of the film. This was released by D&B Films, which was a company that was big in the 80s and, and a little bit into the 90s in Hong Kong, but collapsed in spectacular fashion with the sequel to this film, which was called Black Hat 2 which a lot of people have actually told me is even better. This is my first time seeing this film. A lot of people have said that it's even better than this film, so I'm excited to try to track that down and check that out. Um, but suffice it to say, the um, the they put out, uh, uh, yeah, I think the in-line, I, I wrote it down, the in-the-line of duty films, which are very, very popular. Um, Legacy of Rage with, with Brandon Lee, you know, which is a hugely popular film. Royal Warriors, Yes Madam, like that kind of stuff. So the, And Dixon Poon, was I, th I think he ran that company or was a huge investor in it and so it was like he was t calling the top shots if you don't know who he is he was Michelle Yeoh's husband way back in the day and then they got divorced at some point but um so he was like a big player on the scene at the time so what I'm gonna do is I have a lot to say about this movie usually when I do these reviews I focus mostly on the blu-ray review and give you a little bit of my thoughts and then try to get out of your hair but I'm gonna maybe do the opposite this time and talk more about my thoughts about this movie because I just have a lot to say about it and a lot of that is based on the fact that I uh, am a writer. So if you if you don't watch the channel a ton or if you're not familiar with my kind of story, I'm just showing this off to you again. I will show off the full physical release, I promise to you, when I get deeper into the review. But um, uh, I went to grad school for screenwriting and then I spent several years, like seven or eight years or so, reading screenplays professionally. So I read, I started as an intern, then I got hired. That was at Lionsgate. Um, and then I went and I did, like, I worked for producers as like a kind of a gun for hire. I did some production companies. I worked with a couple screenwriters who had early drafts who were trying to take them to final drafts and I helped them like kind of hone in on what they were trying to say, how they were trying to say it. So writing is something that's like very central to the way that I watch movies, especially when you're watching Watching genre films like this, which are very heavily dependent on concept, world, script, stuff that's largely written. And now I know that in Hong Kong, um, the script process is very, very different. And a lot of times, like, you know, I, I interviewed Simon Wilson, who is in the film Vampire's Breakfast, which if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's a great film. It came out in, a, uh, in Hong Kong on Blu-ray pretty recently. And so Simon said that the script for Vampire's Breakfast was literally one piece of paper, eight and a half by 11, and it was bullet points, like this happens, this happens, this happens, and like everything else was improvised and made up on the set, and even those bullet points changed as they went along. But so, so when I say script, I'm not necessarily analyzing like what you would assume to be a written document if it were a Hollywood film, but rather how the information, the characters, the story, um, the character relationships, themes, like all that stuff is conveyed 
in the kind of the container of the film, if you want to call it that. This film is very much a film of two completely different halves to me. The first half of this film is, it, it, it's like in about 45 minutes, because I was, I, I, at some point I looked at my watch and I was like, how long has this movie been on? There are two plot points. That is very, very few. Hong Kong films in particular tend to be very messy. And so, like, if you saw my review of Undeclared War, the Ringo Lam film is just one example that comes to mind right away, which came out in 1990, so just a year before this film. There were probably, like, ten plot points in the first 45 minutes of that movie, maybe even more. That is a very busy film. This film really has two plot points. She gets arrested, she's put in the CIA program. Like, that's it in, like, 45 minutes. In, in a traditional kind of Hollywood film or a more tightly scripted film... That would really be probably about 15 to 20 minutes of screen time if you're talking about a movie that, I think this movie's about 100 minutes long? 96 minutes, yeah. So you wouldn't spend 45 minutes with two plot points. That would really be your break into act two, which would probably be 15, 20 at the max, maybe 30 minutes in, in a traditionally structured American style narrative film, right? So it's very, very interesting to see that very slow movement. And the first half is really about world and character. And that's something that's really big in Hong Kong, you know, character-driven films. Um, and in sci-fi films, obviously, world is very, very important. And this is kind of a light sci-fi movie um, because of how they turn her into the super assassin. So um, what's, what's really interesting about that opening section of the film is it's very heavily metaphorical. And interestingly enough, Frank Jang actually analyzes all this stuff in his commentary track, too. So after I watched the film and I watched Fang's commentary, I was like, hey, he thinks the same things I do. <laughs> total idiot it like validated my, my my opinions about the film but um it's it's very much a metaphor for a woman who is kind of a drifter this is the jade long character who is being treated like crap by men in a system run by men and it is a very patriarchal system which is the police force the prison system and stuff like that who is then literally like used her body is used by men to go on these missions for them, but it's like sadistic. Like she gets beaten in prison. Like she's hosed down with this strong hose. Like people are brutally mean to her. Like they try to like, uh, uh, like, like this one guy throws her through this huge window and tries to murder her. And um, it's, it's like almost like a prison on fire type, like borderline category three style sadism that is happening to this character and it really feels almost like this art house style metaphor film where she is just abused and abused and abused and used and used and used and then they start trying to gaslight her into believing that they've made her life better and they're giving her these special skills and stuff like that right the second half of the film is very much like a a character driven plot thriller where she she's sent to hong kong and she gets a boyfriend and you have that obvious uh, tension building dynamic of, uh, I have a boyfriend now, I'm in love with this guy, I don't want this guy to be hurt, he can't find out who I am. My bosses can't find out that he's here or else they might try to eliminate him because he might discover my secret, right? So there's enormous amounts of character driven tension in the second half of the film. The first half of the film, tension is, this, uh, if you're unfamiliar with like the terminology that people use a lot in screenwriting, tension is how you would like, like that's how a screenwriter would say like suspense or something like that, or like you're trying to create anxiety for the audience, right? Um, it's like Hitchcockian thing, right? So Hitchcock had this thing that um, if you have a bomb under a table and the audience doesn't know it's there and then it just blows up, you get like one little tiny bit of surprise. If the audience knows it's there and they see it ticking down and they see people not realizing it's there, it creates enormous amounts of tension for the audience because there's anticipation and fear and vacillating between hope that people will find it and get away and fear that they won't, right? So that's like a, like the kind of fundamental principle of writing like thrillers and those types of films. Um, and so the first half of this film has no tension at all. There's no dynamic in the plot. It, you're just watch. It's a very passive first half of the film. You're essentially just a witness to this woman being repeatedly abused and then turned into this super spy. And then it flips on a dime and it becomes this very gripping, tense thriller. What's interesting is that Frank Jang actually prefers the first half of the film, and he talks about that in the audio commentary. I kind of prefer the second half because... 
as a writer, that's more my style. So I gravitate more towards that. So obviously, Frank knows way more about these films than I do, has seen way more films than I have, is from Hong Kong, is part of the culture. Like, I'm not saying I'm right and he's wrong. He's probably right. right? I mean, there is probably no right or wrong, right? You like what you like and it is what it is. But I kind of gravitated more towards that second half because they created this tremendous dynamic between the Simon Yam character, the Thomas Lamb character, and the Jade Lung character. And Jade Lung's performance is very good in this film, especially for like a first time actor. That it, you can tell that she's inexperienced as an actor because some of it is like kind of corny and it's like it would be easy to laugh at like some of the line delivery is a little bit awkward and stuff like that. But her physicality is really powerful and intense. And she carries the role through her body really well. Obviously, Simon Liam is like an incredible actor, right? And, and Thomas Lamb, like I said, I really liked his performance. He's so natural. Um, it, you, it's not, you don't feel like you're watching someone acting. You feel like you're just watching that guy who wandered into this scenario. So, um, there's really great action sequences in this film. They're a little bit more, um, they didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have a lot of time on this film and they were up against a lot of constraints. They filmed outside of Hong Kong for a lot of the film. So they filmed in Canada and a little bit in the U S and they filmed in Japan a little bit too. And you can tell that, that they're coming up against the constraints of a system they're not familiar with and that things were a little bit rushed because it doesn't have that same like amazing pop that like a John Woo film, a Ringo Lam film, or like Jackie Samuel, like these amazing action directors and stuff, but also, you know, Choi Hark, but also um, they're not filming in their own native environment where it's easy for them to create these moments, right? They're, they're on time crunch and budget crunch and stuff like that. And so I think part of that figures into it. So the, the action sequences are not like, they're not top tier gonna blow you away. And if you're big into martial arts, I think the fight choreography uh, is probably will be unimpressive to you because they're not, no one in this film is a martial artist, right? They trained a little bit, but it's not a martial arts film really, but there are some fight scenes. Uh, but, but the final kind of blowout fight scene uh, which well, I won't spoil it for you. I almost spoiled it for you. I'm not going to spoil it for you. I really enjoyed. So to talk to you about the, the physical presentation, the bonus features here, much has been made of the fact that 88 Films did their own coloring on this film. They did their own color grading, and they, they used, I think, the laser disc as reference, and they tried to really preserve that early 90s Hong Kong look with the colors, especially with the Hong Kong blue, which is something you'll be familiar with if you watch a lot of these films or if you watch other channels like Times Square Kung Fu does amazing breakdowns of color grading and stuff like that. Um... It's obvious that they didn't have a ton of money on this film with the transfer here because scenes that are shot inside and scenes that are shot outside during the day look fantastic. Scenes that are shot outside at night, in some cases, not always the case, but in some cases, those scenes are hella grainy, like so grainy that it's distracting. And I know that's just the texture and the quality of film. And film is very, very sensitive to light, right? So that's just going to happen if you're filming outside and you're not doing like a bunch of lights, right? If you're shooting on actual film, that's just what happens. It's not a criticism of what 88 Films has done. They've done great, tremendous work, but you can really see that it's not a super high budget film, but they took a lot of time and, and did tons of lighting rigs and all that kind of stuff there. It's really kind of like a shooting from the hip style type of film, which I, as I gather, is really kind of more the Hong Kong style in general, right? So, um, and then the audio is fantastic. There's the English LPCM Mono 2.0. There's the Cantonese LPCM Mono 2.0. Um, and then there's, uh, there's new subtitles on here. And so the book, and, and just to show you, so this is a reversible cover. So it's in a box, I should also say. It's like one of these like hard boxes like the uh, Armor of God release was in and stuff like that. It's really nice package, like really nice packaging. And um, the artwork, I don't want to, uh, I'd be remiss not to mention who did the, a lot of amazing people worked on this release. That's something I want to shout out uh, in this video because I realized that like a lot of the times I'll talk about the company, the director, the people who do the audio commentary, but so many amazing people. So James Neal did the artwork here. And I actually really like this cover here. It's very clean and simple. And I, I just, I think it's very effective. Um, and uh, I want to shout out Brandon Bentley. Brandon Bentley is in my Facebook group and Brandon Bentley does audio syncing for so many releases. And I would imagine that's a huge amount of work. And also every time we watch these films, we're listening to work that Brandon Bentley has done. And I don't always mention him in these videos, but he does really tremendous, incredible work on all these releases. And in my Facebook group, he's very active talking about the releases. People will ask questions like, do you know why the dubbing seems to change in this movie in different scenes. And they'll be like, yeah, we had to do that because of X, Y, and Z. Like he's an amazing resource, an incredibly friendly 
kind person and um, does incredible work. So the booklet here is an interview with Shan Tam and Michael Parker, who were the assistants to the director of this film, if I'm understanding it correctly. They worked on the movie. And they talk about, it's it's like a 20 plus page long interview in which they are talking about what it was like to work on this film. And they especially talk about the um, the problems with working in Canada as a Hong Kong crew. And as Stephen Shin, the director, would like constantly lose his temper because he'd be like, we're going to do this. And they'd be like, okay, they'd get all the permits. And then they'd show up on the day and he's like, I want to do this instead. And they'd be like, we can't do that. We don't have a permit for it. And he's like, who cares? It's like, it's Canada. It's not Hong Kong. We can't do it. Like, we'll get in trouble. Like, the laws are different. We paid for this. We paid for that. But it gives you really great insight into the Hong Kong film industry, too, because you realize that they're talking about how, like, you know, my job title was officially this, but I was doing all these other things too. And like the people in Canada didn't understand, like, are you the line producer? Are you like the this? Are you the that? Are you the location manager or the unit production manager? And the guy was just like, I sure, yes, I'm all of those things. Because they don't divide it like that. And it almost sounds to me like working on a Hong Kong film is like being in a theater troupe where like everyone pitches in and contributes and, and it's not as much about I'm going to play my part and get my paycheck as it is about let's make a movie. Uh, I love this artwork. So I just it's so clean with that line right down the middle. And the I, I just, it's so I did, this is a reversible sleeve and I did reverse it, but I also really like this artwork, which is also the menu. This is the, um, the Blu-ray menu when you pop it in. And then, um, there's a poster in here and there are, uh, like the reproduction lobby cards. So to show you the poster, you get that artwork on one side and that artwork on the other side. And then I will show you the lobby cards here. And I have not taken the lobby cards out to look at them, so I hope they are not YouTube inappropriate. <laughs> we might have to do some blurring on here in case Jade Lung is in a state of undress in any of these. All right, so, see the, so there's Simon Yam there and Jade Lung. And that's Thomas Lamb here. And Jade, and there you go. And then the back is just like that kind of thing, the logo for the film. Um, so there you go. So the commentary tracks. Oh, and I should also say, actually, before I get into that, there's an interview on here with Jade Lung, which is really, really cool. It's eight minutes long. Oh, eight and a half minutes, I should say. And uh, that was set up and done by Frank Zhang, who I believe also did the subtitles to it. So big shout out to Frank, who is amazing. He's just an awesome person. I've interviewed him twice and uh, on this channel. So you'll have seen that if you know that. And he does, he did a commentary track on here too. He's just such an uh, incredible resource for these releases and for fans of these films. So Jade Lung just kind of talks about like what her acting process was, being new to acting, how they trained her for the film. Uh, Simon Yam was like hugely helpful with like helping her analyze her character and get into her character and understand her character. She said that Stephen Shin was also very helpful because he shot the film chronologically. So she kind of grew into her character as the film went along and that helped her a lot in the process of understanding how to act basically because she, like i said she was a model and didn't have any acting training so she was brand new to it she seems very humble and very chill and like it was a really uh it was a really nice little interview so i really enjoyed that and then two commentary tracks you have frank and you have mike and arna and you know that i love commentary tracks from both of these parties so like i said frank does like very deep analysis of the the metaphors in this film going as far as to be like if you look in the background of this scene the windows have lines across them which look like prison bars reiterating the metaphor of the fact that she's trapped and like like he goes so deep into the metaphorical analysis of this film and he's saying kind of similar points to the points that i made earlier but going much deeper into the context of it cultural context and stuff like that one of the other things that frank mentions that i never would have picked up on that is so obvious when he starts talking about it is an other very very popular film which is not the femme nikita that this film was obviously influenced by, which was an American film that was a huge hit in Hong Kong. I'm not going to spoil what that is for you because the experience of listening to Frank talk about it and explain it was real. It was like this light bulb went on in my head. And I was like, oh yeah, like it's so obvious. But because there's this overriding, di you know, uh, not dialogue, but narrative of the femme Nikita involved in this film, when you talk about this film, I, I'm not, I wasn't even thinking about other cinematic reference points. So when Frank starts talking about it, it's like, oh, yes, obviously. And, um, you know, as always, Frank speaks the language. So he talks about what they're saying in Cantonese, the puns, the things that aren't translated exactly the same. He talks about what the title is, um, which is actually, I think, exactly the same, um, which is very rarely the case. But I think it's a direct translation of the title. And 
just it's just an incredible commentary track from someone who really loves this film and really wants you to love it too and honestly my appreciation for this film grew listening to frank talk about it mike and arna have like a classic mike and arna commentary track it is hilarious because they're kind of like this movie is in some ways kind of silly right it's like an early 90s low budget action film with a sci-fi element to it and a lot of the films of that kind of subgenre are kind of inherently preposterous and silly right and it's not a disrespectful making fun of the movie they're having fun just kind of laughing along to the movie like why is this guy wearing like in the open if you've seen the opening scene they're like why is that guy wearing that shirt and why is he talking like that like th there are inherent absurdities to this film that they point out in a loving way which i really liked and and they talk about um uh like dnb films and frank i should also mention that frank gives a really thorough breakdown of what happened to dnb films and why it collapsed and frank also talks about how jade long really seriously injured herself in one scene in this film so and again i won't spoil which scene that is but it's really interesting to learn that but um mike and arna uh they talk about, and Mike and Arna and Frank Jang actually both talk about Simon Yam and how he's just like the nicest person in the world. And he's like so unpretentious, so kind. Uh, Frank hung out with Simon Yam at the New York Asian Film Festival when he was like receiving an honorary award there, like went out to dinner with him and was like trying to get a taxi with him at Russia. He tells like a great story about hanging out with Simon Yam. He just seems like the nicest coolest chillest kindest person um and fingers crossed they might be able to get simon yam for an interview for future releases for 88 or eureka or i don't know who but um they tried they reached out to him about this but he was in mainland china and i from what i understand it's very very difficult to film interviews with people in mainland china because it's hard to do it on zoom because the internet is kind of un unreliable and um it's hard to get like camera crews in there and like to, to get the footage out it's just it's just the logistics of it are much harder than if they're in hong kong i guess um but uh, but the Mike and Arna commentary track is great, and there's you know I mean they know all these people personally. Arna, I mean Mike especially does. And oh, one of the things they talk about that I thought was really interesting. You know, Arna is a filmmaker, and he he's a very visual person. If you've ever listened to him speak or spoken to him, he's he, he's just someone who's very very visual, right? And so watching this film, he'll be like, you know, this is like the cinematography here is a bit odd and it doesn't make a lot of sense but like over here it's really fantastic and the really well framed shots and they talk about how there were multiple crews on this film so like they had a canada crew they had a hong kong crew they had a japan crew and they were using different camera crews different cinematographers and all that kind of stuff and you can see that in the film and you can see that in the composition of the shots and how there's different lighting applied in different um sections of the film and it was a really cool breakdown of, of how that works so that's the black cat release and there's also trailers on here i should say um let me just read you what's on here there's a newly constructed trailer there's an english language trailer there's the original hong kong trailer and there's the tai seng trailer reconstruction so just to let you know that that's on here so this is black cat it's the 88 films blu-ray uh if i didn't say before but i think i did this release in late february of 2022 this is the limited special edition with like you know, in the case and everything like that. So, uh, you know, bottom line, if you're a fan of those types of like lower budgeted, early 90s, um, like light sci-fi action thriller type of movies, uh, if you like Girls With Guns movies and that kind of stuff, if you like kind of like the second, third tier uh heroic bloodshed type films i know there are some people who who just like john woo is like everything to them and they're just like they love john woo they're obsessed with john woo they get they can get down with like ringo lamb Choi hawk like the higher quality directors in that kind of echelon but they don't really dig like the lesser budgeted stuff or the stuff with slightly less prodigiously talented visual designers directors cinematographers and stuff like that so and i totally understand that and you know as i said before you like what you like and it is what it is if you're only a, if you're like a gung-ho john woo and everything else sucks kind of person i don't think you would dig this movie but so anyway it's black cat like i said it's 88 films my name is will you are watching hong kong cinema appreciation society as always i thank you so much for watching and we will see you next time